There is a gentleman who is a bit worried in the status quo about those minority groups, right, which are which are very very disadvantaged. We are very very worried about these sort of people who don't get equal rights to opportunity, who don't get access to resources. And we definitely think we need to follow the Serbian policy in order to try and just give them that, right? So, firstly, a couple of things I need to say, a couple of things to set up. All right, so firstly, by when we're defining things like minority groups, we're talking about groups which are minor, which are not just a minority, but which are also disadvantaged. Which by, by disadvantage, we just mean a pure lack of access to resources. Right? A good example of this would probably be this, this the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes that are present within India. Right? Then after that, right, we also like to just propose a specific model which we have. So firstly, right, we like to have a quota reservation of around nine percent. All right, within. Of nine percent within colleges, which are reserved just for these minority groups, right? Moreover, we think that when these groups, uh, that when these people come into the university in itself, we're going to have mentors for for these sort of people in order to help them, you know, integrate much better to their college, especially considering just how they came from disadvantaged situation in the first place. Furthermore, we're going to give scholarships to those people. Uh, so, furthermore, we're going to give scholarships to those groups of people, right, who need it. No, thank you. We're going to give scholarships to those groups of people, right, who need it. Thirdly, and fourthly, we're even going to have awareness schemes, right, so that people. So the rich people understand as to why exactly these poor people need it, right? And moreover, we think that college that uh, that the college are the ones who get to decide who exactly those top ten percent are really going to be. All right. So now, having having outlined all of this, let's understand why exactly people remain disadvantaged today. We think there are significant psychological, social, and economic causes, and financial causes, and financial causes. But before that, yes. Sorry, yeah. All right. So, firstly, with regards to, to psychological causes, right? So, we say that the current people have a mentality that they really cannot improve. That there really is no opportunities for them to improve. And so, since they can't make it to college, they might as well not get educated in the first place. All right. There are various social causes, well, with regards to societal norms and perception by others, which we think is really, really bad. And thirdly, about various financial causes, which is obviously the lack of access to resources. So, today, I'm going to talk to you about two main arguments. Firstly, why exactly this is unfair, and secondly, what are the positive effects on our side of the house? So, firstly, why is this policy unfair? So, we. We know, we know that there's been a history, you know, of these groups of people who've been disadvantaged for long periods of time, right? And more, we think that we actually promote meritocracy in the long run because we try our best to put everyone in a more equal starting point, right? Which we think is very, very important. So why exactly is this unfair? Firstly, because we think that these poor disadvantaged groups are, are victims of the lottery of birth, right? They lose out because they're facing cons bad consequences of decisions that they never really even made. Firstly, and secondly, because we think that those people never really got to choose where exactly they're born and whom exactly they're born to, right? And we think that this is especially bad because they get to face bad consequences because of it. We didn't think that they really got to choose. They didn't choose to be born to poor parents or to a minority group, which is heavily discriminated against. We think this is particularly bad because, as a result of these sort of things, right, their consequences are things such as people facing poor quality of life, right. We think that they have lo loss of various different kinds of rights, right, to a certain extent, and even the right to life, definitely the right to dignity, the right to respect, and things like that. We think there's an imposition of hardship put upon them by others, right, which is really bad. But most importantly, we think that they really it's really very very hard for them to opt out. Of this disadvantage situation, right? Which we think is really, really important. Apart from the fact there's no freedom to opt into it, there's also it's also very, very hard for them to opt out of it. So so, having given all of that, we think that definitely poor people are in, uh, the, uh, that these groups of people are in a very, very poor situation, right? And we definitely need to help them. So, how exactly do we really help them through our policy? So, when we help them, right, we, we take care of the various psychological, social, and financial causes. Firstly, psychological causes. So, we think in our sort of situation, right, people get incentivized to work harder, especially those in minority groups. Why? Because now they understand that there are more opportunities being left available for them, right? Which we think is really, really important. And since opportunities are available for them now, we think that the gender Definitely, you're going to feel a lot more empowered. A. B. That we think that essentially we're going to we're going to encourage people at the very grassroots level to get educated in the first place because now there's a much greater chance of them, you know, of them uh, getting access to resources, right, through college and things like that. Next is on this issue of social causes, right? So first thing we're saying that anyways we're going to educate, you know, the other people, that is the rich people, are people of a higher status, you know, through awareness schemes so that they understand as to why exactly discrimination is wrong. But more importantly, right, we think that these poor groups of people definitely over a long period of time are going to get more. More education are going to get more knowledge in places like college, right? We think that they're going to have greater access and greater skills and stuff like that. What does this mean? This means they're going to become, over the long run, far more productive members of society, right? We think they're really going to be able to contribute back because they have these necessary life skills and they will provide jobs and things like that. And we think that that's the first step towards general acceptance. 
When people around them realize that these people also that their status is rising, and more importantly, right, when they uh, when they able to actually have, when they have the skills to actually contribute and do things like that, we understand that this is going to take a long period of time. But we think it's much better than their the house, where people are going to get even more entrenched, you know, in the bad situation that they already are in, right? So what do we think this is? Why do we so another thing, right? We think that this is very good because it also fulfills the the, the primary state's objective of promoting of promoting the welfare to the citizens, and more important, we think that it actually gets to integrate them back into society, right? We think these groups of people. Are Faced issues such as social exclusion for a long, long time. When they become more productive members of society, other people are going to start respecting them. And we think that thereby, as the first step towards them being integrated back into society, their rights of dignity and self respect are being given back to them. Finally, a financial cause, which we think is pretty obvious, we think, anyways, right, we're going to give them greater capacity to actually get a job because, as I've already stated before, we're going to give them necessary life skills and things. We're going to give them very, very useful skills which they can use in order to decide which job they even want to have, right? So we give them greater access of we give them greater access to various different kinds of opportunities, right? And and finally, we just give them greater access to a lot, lot more resources. So within on our side of the house, what essentially we do is that we give the benefit minority groups very, very greatly by taking care of very key issues which keep them disadvantaged in, in our society. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we say that, they, that there is a great harm that's being done in society today, right? We think that it's extraordinarily unfair that these poor people are not being given the necessary opportunities, and that's why we have this sort of a policy. So we think our policy is morally justified and is far more practical. Vikram is going to talk to you about a lot of other different things, right? Including culture apathy, including how this benefits the college, and how this just you know, creates a much better work ethic. On that note, we urge you to propose. Just a reminder all participants, there shall be no points of information during the speech. All questions must be asked during the cross-examination. And with that, I would like to invite the third speaker of side opposition to cross-examine the first speaker of side proposition. I'm sorry, if we just repeat your question, is your mic working? Would you make it known whether these decisions about applicants ultimately came down to whether it was based on merit or whether it was because of affirmative action? Well, yes, of course. The, the point of having the awareness scheme in the first place is so that people understand that the reason as to why they're given these sort of benefits is because of the situations of surrounding that they're actually being put into in the first place. That's why we think it's inherently unfair, and that's why promoting this sort of a policy. Well, what do you think is the difference between having these people coming from these minority groups, having a personal mentor, or them having completely their own university, where the pace of their course is tailored to them? Well, firstly, let me say that as it is, people are going to get into very, very poor universities in the first place because, you know, they don't have access to resources to even get proper education facilities in the first place. So as it is, they're going to have very, very bad education criteria. They're going to get into courses which they can actually, when they actually can get into better courses, more suited to their mental capabilities, but just because of things like access of resources don't really even get But surely if you were a minority student who got into one of these universities based on your own hard work and on your own merit, and now you were branded under this umbrella of being a quoted child, surely you would feel you're disillusioned because now you're onto that umbrella. Right. So first we think that's not true, right? Firstly, because we think I do put in a lot of hard work because we're still going to take the top 10% of all those who apply to the job anyways. But secondly, we're going to say that anyways, we're going to be understand that when you get into college, you're actually going to put in a lot of hard work over there in itself, right? That's what's going to remove the, the, the entire stigma of them being a quota child. Because they get into it, they get to work hard and get to pro get, and get promoted, you know, and get promoted over the course of the four years. The and once we... they get into the job anyways, right? If this we is the case, get wouldn't you say that teaching and improving the resources that these people have access to in the first place will be the organic solution to this fundamental problem. I'm sorry, could you just repeat it? Wouldn't you believe that improving teaching quality and improving the resources that these people actually have access to will be the organic solution to the problem? Well, sidestepping all okay, of this right, hate right. and sidestepping all of the marginality that you're suppressing Right, right, right. So first we say organic solution is not the best solution, right? Because it's just gonna take a long, long time. We're fine with having great you know, we're great, we're fine with having you know great facilities in place. We can do that on our side of the house as well. But on top of that, we like to give them the chances right now for them to get into university, you know, give them good life skills over the course of four years so that at least within the shorter run, less people get oppressed on our side of the house and for a shorter period of time, as opposed to in your side of the house, where they get oppressed for a longer period of time and ultimately you hope over the over a long period of time that they just, you know, might get better facilities and they just might end up in a better into better colleges.
Thank you. With that, I would like to call the first speaker of side opposition to present the Dean's arguments. When a Native American student walks into his first economic class in Harvard University, everyone looks at him. Everyone believes that he doesn't deserve to be there, and thus they treat him differently. Five years down the line, ladies and gentlemen, he walks into his first job interview and experiences the exact same thing. He doesn't get the job. That's because team proposition today attach a tag to him that he's only there to fit a quota, perpetuating the stigma that traps them, the minorities, in the first place, ladies and gentlemen. So firstly, onto my first question in regard to about whether or not this is an effective means of um, improving the position of minorities in society today. So firstly, in their model, they told us they would only have 9% of minorities in university. So we think that this is a very arbitrary number. We don't actually think that they're fighting this debate on the right grounds, because we think that that's the sort of number of minorities that exist in universities at the moment. So all of the points they're telling us today about why this is such an effective measure, we think that it actually makes it less effective, because they don't, we don't think that they have a large enough quota at the moment. But what we would also tell you is that the issue with having only 9% in universities is that these minorities will feel very isolated. They're not going to be talking to you in his speech about why that's so harmful, but we don't think what it's going to actually help their growth and help them learn the sorts of life skills they tell us they will be doing on their side of the house. Now onto the second idea Pranav discussed about the lottery of birth. We can concede on our side today that the lottery of birth is an incredibly bad thing and we can recognise that these minorities do suffer throughout their life. But we think all we really need to prove to you is that we make sure that, in, that we don't actually harm the position of minorities in society and, and their side perpetuates it to prove to you that we win the debate. We're going to be doing this around my substantive case and their aunt. But secondly, we'd also tell you is that on our side of the house, we're also okay with helping them from funding um, the areas that where minorities are present and putting this sort of money into um, education. We think that we can do that on our side as well. We think that that also reverses the effects of the lottery of birth. But secondly, they brought us this idea about how educating people in university and making them aware about the why minorities are there is a good thing. What we would tell you is that a lot of often these people in university or, or candidates who are trying to get into university won't really care why this minority deserves to be there because of the sort of disadvantages they've had for their life. All they'll care about, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that that candidate didn't get in or that these people don't deserve to be there. They'll feel like they miss out. We think they're going to blame the minorities. That's going to cause resentment, ladies and gentlemen. They aren't going to be raised awareness about it. But firstly, they'd also tell us today that, um, that they will get into jobs. I'm going to be proving to you my substantive about what actually they are going to be getting the jobs, and I'll flag that up when I get to this, but also about how they're going to get nice skills. I'll also be discussing that in my substantive. So now moving on to my first point today about how we und they undermine uh, meritocracy and why it's so important that we have meritocracy in, uh, in universities. So we tell you that under the status quo, entrance to most universities is decided by merit. For example, we think that the candidates with the best qualifications are the ones that are picked. We think that the, due to this system, no other factors like someone's skin colour are considered. So how does team proposition change today? We think that they make ethnicity part of the calculus made when they choose these um, successful candidates. And thus we think that they reduce the part that merit actually plays. So why is this system of meritocracy so important in education? We tell you that this is because of the nature of university. Firstly, it's one which is a much higher standard than high school and other things. We say that it's because the academic level is much higher. But secondly, we tell you that a feature of university is that they don't get much support, the students in the school. We tell you that instead, this is a very independent learning. We don't think that the sort of lectures are going to be um, one where they will repeat things twice for minorities who don't actually understand what's going on. So what is this going to mean? Firstly, we think that there's going to be much higher dropout rates with minorities, because we think that they're going to go into a mindset where they don't think that they can actually be successful 
successful at doing a certain degree because they don't think that they're good enough, they think that they're only there because of a quota. We think that this is evident in places like UCLA, that there's a higher amount of African Americans who drop out than there are white people. We think that we can see that our policy actually has these harms. But secondly, we also think that these people would be likely to fail because they aren't at the same academic ability as those other students in their class. We think that that's incredibly harmful because of the fact that the things that they're trying to tell us that they give them, such as life skills, don't actually occur, ladies and gentlemen, because these people aren't the type of right caliber for that class. But on our side, what do we do? We think that they go to a university with the same sort of caliber as students because they're hit, fair, they're hit fairly. We see that therefore there is an isolation of, uh, in the campus. We think that they don't feel intimidated by the higher caliber of students, and therefore we think they're much more likely to be successful. But secondly, we'd also tell you that it creates a label, ladies and gentlemen. We think there's two types of people. Those that actually deserve to go to these universities and are from a minority, and those that don't. But both of these two stakeholders get grouped under the same umbrella, which is that they are only there to fill a quota. They don't deserve to be there. So why is this, this grouping bad? We think that firstly, it reinforces the stereotype that these people from minorities just aren't good enough, that they need help from other people in society to be successful. But secondly, what we tell you is that there's harms within the university itself, things like isolation, and segregation that aren't going to be telling you why that's so harmful, but also we tell you is that there are harms after school. For example, in job applications, we think that people are going to discriminate. If they have two candidates who have both gone to Harvard University, one of them is white and one of them is from a minority, they're going to choose the white candidate, ladies and gentlemen, because they believe that the white person actually got into Harvard because he deserved to be there, not because he was there to fill a quota. We see that the minorities miss out. But also, what we tell you is that this is incredibly harmful because of the fact that we don't think we're actually going to get more minorities in the boardroom or in CEO positions. We said instead they're going to stay in, in middle management even when they do actually deserve to be in the boardrooms because they're qualified, but because they're grouped under the same umbrella that they don't deserve to be there, they don't get there, ladies and gentlemen. But on our side, we allow minorities to get these positions because there is no tag of prejudice that says they were there only because they were filling a quota. So because we make these people role models to their community and essentially we allow these people to fairly get to where they deserve to be in society and we don't create a prejudice that they do in their side of house, we beg you to oppose today. Thank you, ma'am. I will now like to invite the third speaker of side of proposition to cross examine the first speaker of side opposition. Don't you think that we are far more morally justified since we give people opportunities that they were denied to owing to a set of circumstances that they didn't subscribe to in the first place? Okay, so we think that we also combat on our side of the house the fact that like the lottery of birth and people um, don't get opportunities. We do that through funding, we think these schemes already exist, but also we can prove to you today that this actually makes things worse for these minorities than we think that our point still stands. We think that we're also very principally justified in not allowing them to do this because it only makes the situation for these mi minorities worse. So you spoke about excluding our, our policy excludes minorities from the rest of the community, right? Don't you think that providing tailor-made courses that tailor-made to the needs of the minority groups will alienate, exclude, and differentiate, from the rest, differentiate them from the rest of society even more? Okay, so he said we're going to exclude them. Ladies and gentlemen, what we basically mean on our side of the house today is that these minorities are only going to be excluded from, camp from in the campus because the, the majority of the campus, we think that what they're going to be is that these minorities don't deserve to be there. We think that it's going to cause resentment. We think that they're going to be isolated. We think that that's an issue because we think that these people aren't going to feel comfortable learning in that environment. Therefore, we don't think any of the, heart, the benefits they tell us happen in their side of the house actually do like them learning life skills. But then, do you think, but then, do you think that the rich have more tolerance capacity towards the and over the long run, especially with the awareness campaign we have in place. This isn't about the rich not understanding the sort of plight of poor people and minorities, ladies and gentlemen. This is the fact that people get upset when they see that they didn't get into a university because the minority did. Not because the minority deserved to be there, but because of the fact that they are from a certain place. That's going to breed resentment from other people in society, ladies and gentlemen. That's going to cause more prejudice than on your side of the house. But then, don't you think the minority communities exist in the first place simply because the majority communities have suppressed them so far? So don't you think it's fine to take away a few rights of the majority community for the benefit in the long run? Okay, even if that was true, ladies and gentlemen, on their side of the house, they reduce the position of these minorities because they create a prejudice which says these minorities aren't good enough, they need the help of the rich people. That's an unfair um, that's an unfair tag to place them. We think it's much more better, ladies and gentlemen, if we say that these minorities are actually able to get there themselves, we don't give them a leg up, that creates harmful stereotypes that our side actually gets rid of today. Finally, do, do you, and if so, why do you think the meritocracy is justified when the participants are not on the level playing playing field. Okay, so we think that.
Basically, ladies and gentlemen, all of that points up principle, don't stand in. We can prove to you that we actually look after these um, minorities. We tell you that on our side of the house, we still reverse the effects of them not having like a, a, the bad side of the lottery of birth. We do those, we reverse those effects on our side of the house as well. We think that we just do it in a different way, in a way that doesn't create a harmful prejudice like their side of the house does. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to invite the second speaker of side proposition to further his team's argument. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start my substantive, it's imperative that I deal with some reports. We've heard some really interesting stuff from that side. Right? We'll go step by step as to what they told us. Right? Firstly, they've come to this whole idea of a quota child, right? Where they're going to be branded in colleges, you know, as a, as, and they're going to be isolated because they've gotten through this quota, right? And to that, I'd say a number of things. Firstly, we need even to actually get uh, get onto this quota system. They're going to have to work hard to actually become better than the rest of the disadvantaged group. So we think that they're going to have to work hard anyway on our side. Secondly, we think when they actually start speaking in college, when they start participating in college discussions, people are going to realize their worth. Right? We don't think members of disadvantaged groups are inherently stupid, right? When they, when they start talking, when they start participating, people are going to realize their value to society and the college, college life in general. So we don't think they're going to be isolated. Thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, we've already told you we're going to set up intent. We're going to heighten awareness schemes. We're going to heighten awareness programs so people know the reason why they're disadvantaged and we don't think that isolation is really going to take place. Next week we heard uh, the reactions about how we're fighting along the 9%, you know, that doesn't really matter. To that we say two things, right? Firstly, we're on right with actually increasing to let's say 15% or 16%, right? We just want a minority group presentation or more minority group presentation in college. Secondly, we also told you that we're giving special scholarships and bursaries which will really motivate them to actually come into college, right? Thirdly, we have on their side this argument of meritocracy, right? That how it isn't really fair to actually those who actually deserve to go to college, right? To that we say two things again. Firstly, we don't think meritocracy really exists. We don't think meritocracy is a real thing on their side, right? But on, on their side, people really aren't on the same playing field, right? People they really they really don't aren't starting from the same uh, starting points. We don't think it's fair to actually, you know, bar disadvantaged people who don't have the same access resources, who aren't on the same starting point to actually not get into college, right? Secondly, we also say there's meritocracy on our side, right? To actually get under this college quota, the disadvantaged people needs to work hard so they become better than the rest of the disadvantaged society. Thirdly, fourthly, ladies and gentlemen, we heard in their side about how they won't be able to cope up, right? And about how college life is going to be too hard on them. So that again, we say two things, right? Firstly, we're assigning mentors. We're assigning mentors to help them to get through college. We're assigning people to actually assist them through the college process, right? Secondly, we tell you that they're really, really motivated anyway, right? And I'll come to that in my substantive case. Fifthly, ladies and gentlemen, we heard this idea about how they won't get into boardrooms and they're not going to get top CEO jobs. And let me say, we're not right with that. We don't want these people immediately getting into boardrooms, but at least on our side, they have the body of knowledge they're going to get from college. They're going to get jobs now, but perhaps not the best jobs, but they're going to get jobs that will be able to feed their families and support themselves. So on our side, they have the body of knowledge they're going to get from college. They're going to get jobs, maybe not the best jobs, but at least that's a starting point, and that's a way better on that point. Now let's move on to my substantive case, right? What am I going to talk to you about today? Today I'm going to talk to you about firstly, how we're breaking trends of abuse. Secondly, I'm going to talk to you about why this policy is beneficial for colleges. And thirdly, I'm going to tell you how it's going to actually benefit the advantage section of society in the long run, right? Firstly, this argument regarding this culture of apathy and these trends of abuse, right? Which is the members of disadvantaged groups, actually those that have actually lost hope and faith in both themselves and the government, right? These are individuals existing on the fringes of society more, uh, often, right? We see Furthermore, that they're actually subject to historical abuse, right? Systematic abuse taking place. And we see that particularly evident in, in the scheduled caste and scheduled trials under India, right? These are systematic uh, trends of abuse, right? It is going on for centuries, ladies and gentlemen. And because it's so systematic, they are often excluded from political dialogue, right? It becomes so incredibly hard for them to opt out because of such intense culture, this intense culture of apathy towards them, right? We see, moreover, that advantaged members of society, 
those that are part of this, you know, more superior part of society, are actually perpetuating these cycles of abuse. Right? They're the ones going out and actually discriminating them. They're the ones actually uh, plummeting them further into the disadvantaged part of society. Right? And we see that because this culture of apathy is so intense, and because they, they find it extraordinarily hard to get out of this culture of apathy, to get out of, you know, rise out of disadvantage on their own, right? which it gets worse on their side, we need to help them. right? We need this policy. Why? For three main reasons. Right? Firstly, we're opening up avenues to these members of disadvantaged groups that weren't actually open previously. Right? It was extraordinarily hard for a member of the black community to get into a college because of the intense crime and the, the poverty they live in, but now we're opening up avenues for them to actually rise out of disadvantage. Right? Second reason, gentlemen, we spread a positive message. Right? We're telling these members of the disadvantaged state that the state isn't out to get them, they're not isolated, but the state is actually extending a helping hand to them, ladies and gentlemen. We see that when this message is brought out, when we're telling them, you're disadvantaged, we understand your disadvantage, we, we're here to help you, we're here to assist you to become better members of society, to become more contributing members of society. We think that's important, right? We're sending a positive message where the state isn't out to get them, but actually out to assist them, right? Thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, we're actually ins instilling hope amongst these members of disadvantaged group, right? We think that we're urging them to rise up out of disadvantage, right? We're urging them, we're telling them, you can do it, we're helping you, you can get out of your disadvantage, right? And because of this, Right? When they're going to be really, really motivated in college, right? They're going to be motivated to work hard, they're going to be motivated to work with college, they're going to be motivated to work with their mentors. But we think that because we're actually helping them, because we're urging them, they're going to have more motivation, the more inspiration to do better in college and actually get a better job, actually you know, perform well when they're doing a job interview, right? Because they're so motivated, because they're organize out of disadvantage, right? Now, lastly, and secondly, I'm going to talk about how it's a benefit for the college, right? We're going to tell you that because colleges are centers of innovation and centers of radical thought, centers of thought that actually change society, we need disadvantaged, more disadvantaged people in those colleges, right? We think they're going to benefit from this diversity because now their views are represented in discussions, their aspirations are represented in policy, right? We think that colleges are going to positively benefit from diversity because better innovation is going to take place because there's more better discussion, there's more diversity in those discussions, right? Last ladies and gentlemen, we'll tell you about how it's actually better in competition amongst the uh, more advantaged part of society. Right? We're telling you, we're actually urging them to further exploit the resources that they have access to when we tell them they have less place in college to get to. We're telling them, you have resources enough, you have enough options, exploit them, get those reduced, you know, them, uh, uh, reduced seat in college. Right? So that's what I've told you today. I've told you that meritocracy doesn't really exist on their side. I've told you that, you know, that you know, they will be able to cope up and they really won't be in isolation. I've talked to you about the trends of abuse we see on disadvantaged people. I've told you how it's going to motivate them and actually allow them to become more productive for society. And I've told you how it's better for society in general. And with these reasons, we urge you to propose. Cross-examine the second speaker of Cyber Opposition. Tell us how your policy is actually going to benefit the minority child who's going to be applying to university in five years' time. Do you think that these children are ever going to get into university not because of affirmative action? Well, yes, we think that a few of them will get maybe the most advantage of the disadvantage. We think a few of them have the best access to it. But we're worried about those, the majority of those who don't have access to resources, who will find it extraordinarily hard to get to college unless we put this policy. Okay, well, do you not think that people are going to be unsatisfied under your policy because they're not able to join things like the newspapers, they're not able to join societies, because the people at this university are going to feel like they gained a place and they were Alright, two things. Firstly, we've probably told they're really motivated, so they're anyway going to break this wall of isolation. Secondly, we've already told you that they're going to be in a heightened awareness program to tell them why they're actually there. And thirdly, we think that once they start speaking and once they start participating in college, people will realize their worth and won't really isolate them. Okay, but do you actually feel that if these kids who are from these minority communities were actually capable of passing their classes at university, then they would have got in in the first place? So when they do No, 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 we think really that that's that. that those people we really talk about are a really small portion, right? We think really less number of people amongst uh, disadvantaged groups who will actually get into college on their own or actually succeed on their own. We need to help them. We need this policy. We want to look at those majority of disadvantaged people who find it extraordinarily hard to get into college on their own. And surely by improving teaching standards, by improving the amount of resources as we are doing our team opposition, 
then you would be allowing the majority of these people from these minority communities to access universities without the aid of their interaction. Well, Therefore, sidestepping all of the hate, sidestepping all of the marginalisation, well, anyway, which you're proposing. But can it anyway happens on the status quo? Like we know we need to help these modern people. We do have funding for them. We do have enough, you know, resources being channeled them. But it's not enough, Kami. We need them to get into college. We need them to actually realize the benefits of college. We need this policy to actually help them even further. Under your policy of affirmative action, do you ever feel like you could get rid of it once it's in place? Yes. Pranav already told. Talk, Pranav has already talked to you about this, right? We well, feel that once we have affirmative action for a number of years, they're going to become more advantaged, they're going to become more contributing to society, after which we will remove that affirmative action. Do you not believe that these people are going to be placed under a prejudice tag for the rest of their lives and in a wider society apart from just society? Well, we think the prejudice tag anyway takes place in the status quo, right? We think that the more advanced people in society actually perpetuate this tag. So we think by doing this, we're giving them a chance, right? We're giving them an opportunity to go into college, to participate, to get a better quality of life, and so we're actually reducing the tag that they might have under your side. Surely we will be reducing the tag even more and even more effectively under team opposition by providing mass primary education, by providing mass resources, by increasing the teaching capacity for these white communities. Well, Gabby, it's anyway happens on the status quo. I've already told you we do have enough government funding for it. We do have a lot of programs for this, but it's not enough. I'd like to call upon the second speaker of side opposition to further his team's arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, we're quite happy that the lottery of debating has allotted our side opposition today. Because today we stand for meritocracy. Today we stand against further marginalization. And today we stand for organic change. And it's for this reason today that I'll be talking to you about how we improve the, about how their policy hurts the cause of equality by in fact fomenting further resentment towards minorities. But before that, some rebuttal. So there are three major questions that have come up in this debate. Firstly, on the moral justification for their policy. Secondly, on how the college education actually helps these people. And thirdly, on how we actually solve oppression. So let's dive into this first thing, on the moral justification for this policy. So they told us about how, in fact, they create a meritocracy because disadvantages exist. Ladies and gentlemen, our response to that is that their response to pre-existing disadvantages is to disadvantage other people, other groups that don't deserve it, other people who will also, in this circumstance, be victims of the lottery of birth. Actually, we'd like to accept that we're fine with, in fact, prioritizing minority candidates because disparity exists. But we would be okay with this if, in fact, their side actually helped these people and helped them in the long run. And I'm going to prove to you in a second that they don't. And then they said that this, uh, this whole quota tag doesn't apply because A, they work hard. In response to that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to tell you, well, you work hard for any college, you work hard anyway. Okay? We don't think how this, we don't see how this is most significant on their side of the house. And then the second thing they told us on their side of the house is that they level the playing field. In fact, we don't actually think this is true. We've already told you this doesn't happen on their side of the house. Because in fact, the disparity remains, then they're only disadvantaging somebody else. So let's dive into the second thing, onto how the college education impacts these people. Firstly, we think that there is uh, a side Firstly, we think that there exists like psychological, uh, they said that there exists psychological benefits to these people. In response to that, we tell you, in fact, they're, most li they're more likely to be victims of things like depression, they're less likely to be able to approach people to tell them that they need help because that this tag that they are minorities and don't deserve to be there already exists. Then they told us that they actually pick up important skills. We tell you, if they are in a place that they can actually pick up important skills from these universities, they'd make it to these universities without affirmative action. They'd make it to these universities because of meritocracy. So they aren't actually in a place where they, can't, where they can actually pick up from these universities and these skills. Then thirdly, onto this idea of how we solve oppression. They told us about how they integrate them, about how they integrate these people into society. In response, to, in response to that, we tell you, well, actually, there's going to be a large amount of resentment that exists, and we don't actually integrate them within society. They haven't given us any uh, analysis into how we integrate them in the long run. And then secondly, there are issues with their model. So we already told you that this 9% is largely arbitrary and small number. It, it's in fact the same as the quota. They responded to the 
this by telling us that they, we have to uh, like change it to 15%. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that actually this is not going to this is not going to massively impact the benefits on their side of the house. What it is going to do is that, that the harms that we, we are talking about will still accrue on their side of the house. It means that there are no more significant benefits, no further justifications for this policy, but the harms still accrue. Okay, and then they spoke to us about the culture of apathy, and then they said, in fact, that all this that all this has changed on their side of the house because we give them avenues. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't give them avenues because we actually give them a tag that they don't deserve to be here in the first place, that they don't deserve these jobs in the first place, that they can't get into universities on their own merit. So we don't actually make them more advantaged, we don't actually change people's perceptions of them. So ladies and gentlemen, let me dive into um, uh, our, our substantive case today. So firstly, we think um, that this has a polarizing impact on student populations within campus, and Kate has already touched upon this slightly. So we think in the world of side proposition, where universities accept less qualified candidates for limited places, there's going to exist a perception that the students from minority groups are undeserving of their base within the university. This includes both the people that should have been there anyway and would have gotten in on merit, and the people that didn't get in on merit. So what does this lead to? This means that people are more likely to isolate minority candidates, believing that they don't deserve to be there in the first place. This means they're less likely to be able to join things like student newspapers, student government groups like that. For example, at Harvard University, we think there are people that are going to be saying, you shouldn't be on the Harvard Crimson student newspaper because you shouldn't be at Harvard in the first place. You're not deserving of these things. You're not deserving of uh, major positions within our university, within, uh, within our groups. So we think that this largely leads to a segregation along people who, are, who believe that they are men and people who, who other people below believe aren't there. And this is essentially a segregation along majority minority lines. The very kind of segregation that intimidates minorities isolates them from societies. And ladies and gentlemen, there is a harm above and beyond that as well. We think that this means that they're less likely to be able to approach university, to be able to approach other students for help. So the next time that a Hispanic candidate at an Ivy League university gets, uh, falls into depression, they wouldn't be able to access the same amount of medical resources that a white candidate will be able to. Because they know that, it, that there is a perception that exists that they can't deal with these things, that they can't actually cope with these things. On our side of the house, this harm doesn't accrue. On our side of the house, people already know that they're there because it is a meritocracy. So ladies and gentlemen, we think that this disproportionately harms them. Secondly, we think it actually um, leads to further resentment because others blame them for their future outcomes. So we've spoken about why university is so important and why people think it's so important. So when people don't get into a good university, why affirmative action exists, like people who didn't have a good cap application in the first place, or people who had a good application and were denied a place, are both going to blame the people that got in instead of them. They're both going to blame the minority candidate. And this, this, kind, of, um, this, this kind of marginalization, in fact, foments itself in wider society. It means that they're not going to think these people, who are, these people should be in because they're currently underrepresented in society. They're going to think this Hispanic or this Latino took away like, my, uh, my right to this college place simply because um, simply because like, they are the source of all my problems. Ladies and gentlemen, this leads to further scapegoatism. This means that we don't actually improve their lot in society. This means this is the societal tensions that actually exacerbate oppression um, are in fact made worse on their side of the house. So we think that society at large then is going to discriminate against them. We think society at large is going to blame them for their future outcomes. We think that society is going to hurt and we think that this hurts the cause of equality. So ladies and gentlemen, it's quite clear that there are no new benefits from their policy uh, with regards to how people are um, integrated within society because they, the, the college um, education doesn't actually impact them well. In fact, what does happen is that the harms we've spoken about on our side of the house accrue. So ladies and gentlemen, it's for that reason that I'm happy to stand on side opposition today. I would now like to invite the first speaker of side opposition to cross examine the second speaker of side opposition. On the issue of resentment, other people may not have communicated with minority members earlier, but now when minority members speak out and contribute to the college environment, don't you think that others will realize the value of minority members? Again, ladies and gentlemen, we see a refusal to recognize, a refusal to accept and even acknowledge our points about how they're further isolated within these colleges because there is a tag attached to them that they don't deserve to be there in the first place. When will you respond to that? But the alternative that you have proposed is, is providing a separate course of studies for people from minority, minority communities. Don't you think that will alienate and differentiate them from the rest of society even more than what we propose? Actually, ladies and gentlemen, we don't. We see that currently uh, people are open to uh, people from diverse backgrounds having access to some resources. But we don't. We think the issue on their side of the house is that they're there at the university simply because they are they are from a certain ethnic group, which is why other people feel like isolating them. However, on our side of the house, they're there at the university because of merit and they have access to other resources because of because they're disadvantaged largely in society. 
When will you respond to our point about how meritocracy doesn't really apply when the competitors aren't on the playing level playing field? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we see here again they haven't responded to our point about how, in fact, they're solving disadvantage, uh, solving the disadvantage of certain people by disadvantaging other people. In fact, that this college education doesn't actually help these people. If it did help these people, it would be all right. On the issue of caliber and minority people being here simply because they're part of a certain ethnicity or certain race. Do you think the minority groups are even more motivated in this situation to work harder and with a mentor coupled with the fact that they are not inherently stupid they will actually be able to go back to college? No ladies and gentlemen, we simply don't think this is true. We think that people get into certain universities because of a caliber to be at that university. Universities assess their, uh, assess their, their work through school and see whether or not they can cope with these things. We think somebody put into a university much above their caliber will not be able to cope with this. We don't think that, we think that largely even if they are motivated to work harder, they are being isolated, they are being marginalized, they are being massive depression, there will be massive uh, psychological harms from this and steep things that they haven't responded to yet. Don't you think that our side creates more productive members of society by tapping untapped potential from areas that we didn't know existed earlier? Actually, that's simply not true. We've already proven to you that uh, minority candidates don't do not the same benefits that other people do from this college education because they're so ill-placed in this, you know, uh, because, they, because they don't fit in, into this university. And this is what happens when a meritocracy isn't followed. You've spoken to us about improving resources. Well, if improving resources is possible even on our side of the house, but on your side of the house, only certain communities can take advantage of the improved resources. But on our side of the house, everyone can take advantage of these improved resources. Come on. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, that's simply not true. We told you on our side of the house that we're happy to extend these resources to all minorities. We're happy, in fact, to solve the root causes of this oppression. We're happy to allow, uh, to allow colleges to encourage more candidates to apply, to encourage more candidates to be confident. So, in fact, this applies to the widest kinds of society, unlike on their side of the house. Don't you think minority members would be unwilling to take advantage of these resources when they don't have any clear future prospects at hand? Okay, so that's simply not true because on their side of the house, they've told us that uh, actually these people want to come to university. If we accept that they are actually ambitious and want to get into the best universities, we don't see how they not want to get in there in the first place. We don't see why they won't want to take um, help of these resources anyway. Thank you, sir. I would now like to invite the first speaker of side proposition to summarize the team case. Part of their case has reached around this single point that there's going to be prejudice, that there is a tag put on them, that ultimately they're going to blame minority, which is going to be which is going to be the isolation. So we don't agree with that. We've given you several responses, none of which they've really taken care of, right? So firstly, we're saying that what happens is that firstly, you know, we have we have student and teacher mentors that are present to actually help them. So what do they do? We think that they're going to try that since they've been assigned to them, it's just they're going to constantly be supervised, right? They're going to actually go and try and help these people integrate into you know in, in, integrate into college anyways, right? Secondly, right, we're saying that what happened before is that the rich or the people in greater status did not know that the poor people worked so hard, ladies and gentlemen, but now they're going to, right? Because once the individual comes into society and with the help of teaching and student mentors, they start working hard and hard, harder and harder. We think that definitely the, the, the rich people are going to understand, right? They're going to understand that these poor people have worked so hard to get into it and are working so hard right now, probably much harder than they and then a large number of they too, they themselves are working, right? And so we think that definitely, right, isolation is going to reduce, okay? Then thirdly, right, and then thirdly, right, to which, uh, to thirdly to that, we see that anyway, we have awareness schemes in place, right, by which we're going to try and inform people, right, we're going to try and, and so that they know as to why exactly, you know, these poor people came into the position in the first place, right? Fourthly, we're seeing this how we're looking at potential that's actually been untapped, and these poor people get to use their potential within the university, and I'll talk about it in just a second, right? So anyways, right, we're saying that what happened, and, and finally, we're saying that history has proved the worst case scenario, right, Let's say this is all the resentment that they talk about. We think that definitely over a certain period of time, even if it's a long period of time, right, they're going to build a certain amount of tolerance towards these people, right? Coupled with the fact that they anyways work so hard once they get into the university, there's going to be tolerance towards them, right? Built up over a long period of time. And definitely we think that we're fine with that. So long as right now they get opportunities, so long as right now they get to they get various life skills, right? So next, right, they came to us and spoke to us about how exactly these people can't cope in college because they claim that they don't have the necessary.
necessary, they, that, uh, that, uh, they claim that they didn't have the necessary caliber. So we're saying, ladies and gentlemen, that they can do it, right? But the reason as to why they haven't had great performances in school, ladies and gentlemen, is because firstly, they were in extraordinarily disadvantaged backgrounds, right? They didn't get any facilities, didn't get any resources in school. And even though we're willing to provide it, we're saying that that's going to take a really, really long time, right? In order to fully ensure that there's access to resources to all people. So along with that, instead of using organic change, right, where people for a long period of time will still get, will, will still remain oppressed, we prefer this sort of a policy so that at least in the short run, right, people get immediate access to various resources, they get to improve their own life skills, ladies and gentlemen. So we're saying firstly, right, that people, right, that they may not have had great, uh, great facilities in school, so their education, uh, so so in terms of, you know, their education requirement may not be so good, but especially with that group of people whose potential remains untapped, right, for that group of potential to still have caliber, we at least give them the resources to school. And we think that students and teachers and teacher mentors are anyways in place to try and help them achieve that particular kind of caliber, right? The next they claim is how, you know, psychological causes don't actually exist. Uh, psychological causes, right, are actually going to work far against them. We're saying no, because at least they get the opportunity to work harder enough, they get the opportunity to get access to resources under our, under our line, right? So we think that that's far, far better on our side of the house. And ladies and gentlemen, finally we're saying that if their model is so great and does solve all the different kinds of, you know, different kind of issues that we do, we say that we're fine to do that because we think we still, we still are able to provide education, uh, provide, you know, funds to education and stuff like that. We're fine with doing that, but we want this sort of a short-term change so that organic change, right, doesn't, it, which, should, which should probably, you know, take several, several hundred years to come for all we know, right? At least that sort of thing doesn't take place. And right now we give them opportunities and access. Right now we try and reduce the, we try and reduce the harms on our side, but most importantly, we tackle a one or two key issues that exist at their side of the house far more effectively than they do. For all of those reasons, we urge you to propose. Thank you, sir. I would now like to call upon the, fir the first speaker of side opposition to summarize the team's case. in universities. It's 2014, ladies and gentlemen, quotas have increased, resentment has also increased, and integration has decreased. Their policy today doesn't work. Two questions. Whether this, whether this model they're implementing is fair, and secondly, whether it's effective. On to the first question about whether or not the policy they taught us about today was fair. Firstly, they came to us today, and they said it's fair to do this because of the lottery bug, because these people have never had opportunities. So firstly, we started out by telling you we are more than happy with funding schemes into education in these areas. We said that these types of things work. We think that it works best to start this at a young age. But we also, and importantly said in our center house, is their side doesn't actually help these people. Thus, their principle doesn't work when they can't prove they help these people. We said that firstly, these people just aren't good enough to be going to these universities, right? We think that therefore, this is going to mean that these people are either going to drop out when they realize that they can't do the degree, or secondly, they're just going to fail. Thus, on their side of the house, all of the benefits they say that they actually do to help these minorities doesn't actually accrue because these people won't, won't learn the types of skills they tell us that they do. But secondly, we told you that on their side of house, what happens is that a, job, a tag exists where these people are, um, are told, like, are perceived to be not um, deserving of the sort of place they're in university. We think that that translates in jobs where they're told that they aren't good enough. We think that their side creates that harms and thus the sort of benefits they told us don't actually happen. But they also said that their policy, we, we told them that their policy is going to breed resentment by people 
in society when they realize that they're missing out on their university place because of the fact of minorities getting it. It doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen, whether this is actually true. We think that that scapegoat perception is just going to exist because these people are going to believe that that's the case. That's incredibly harmful. We don't think that we have integration with these minorities in, on their side, ladies and gentlemen. Now, whether it was effective. So we told you about how um, we told you about um, we actually remove this stereotype on our side of the house. Whereas we create this one that says that these minorities actually need help from the people that they said we should be taking away their university places from. We create this perception that they need the help to be uplifted. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a harmful perception that exists. We don't think it should. We think it's much better on our side of the house today is if we say, look, these minorities were able to be successful, were able to get to the highest jobs um, on the job market because they worked incredibly hard and you can too. We don't think attached to them this tag that exists that they got extra help. Ladies and gentlemen, that is harmful, that perpetuates the stigma that exists against these people in society and we don't want that today. But also, we tell you, is importantly, they actually get the job on our side of the house. On their side of the house, discrimination comes into play because these people are thought to be not deserving and instead they'll give it to a white candidate instead. Instead, On our side of the house, we don't allow that to happen. But then in response to Vedant's point, they never really told us a good enough response about the sort of isolation that these students will face in the school, ladies and gentlemen. We think that the majority aren't going to let them be part of things like a newspaper, they didn't respond to this analysis, they just said tolerance will happen over time. Ladies and gentlemen, no it won't. This is because of the fact that these people have, are going to have the ingrained, because also these people are going to be intimidated, they aren't even going to try out the newspaper. So because by the end of the debate today, it was our side that allowed that Native American to walk into his job interview and know that he would be treated equally because he deserved to be there, we don't create more prejudice, we erase it, we take the debate today. Thank you, ma'am. And with that, I declare the debate closed.